Well, thanks for staying with us here on Morning Live. Now, international law professor at UNISA, uh, Professor Andre Thomashausen, says that President Cyril Ramaphosa has reached a dead end in his presidency. Now, the professor echoes the views of those who question whether Ramaphosa will step down in the course of this year. And pondering uh, the changes uh, to his cabinet and on the South African posts overall, uh, Ramaphosa uh, has been questioned and uh, Thomas Housen quotes businessman Patrice Mutepe, who said yesterday that only the recruitment of the best managers available globally and an upcoming, an uncompromising rather war on corruption can actually save South Africa's key industries. Now, his assessment is that this wisdom is far from being internalized by the ANC's political elite. A German attorney and professor uh, international emeritus of international law at UNISA, uh, Professor Andre Thomashausen, uh, joins us now to talk more on these views that he expressed. Uh, Professor, thanks so much for your time. Welcome to Morning Live once again. Yes, good morning. Thank you. So uh, first off, uh, I mean, uh, you actually uh, captioned it quite interestingly, South Africa post Ramaphosa. So what inspired those thoughts? Well, it is mainly the reactions of our main trading partners uh, that are amply represented here in South Africa through their embassies and, of course, also the reaction of the international media. The, the guru of all uh, stock exchange analyses, the Financial Times in London, uh, just published two days ago a totally devastating article on the, on the misgovernance uh, of all state-owned enterprises and, and the, the abysmal bad performance of the South African economy. We've lost nearly 2% of GDP, a downturn that is dramatic and that is completely uh, in contrast to GDP growth in our region, in our neighboring countries and, and worldwide after COVID economies have recovered except in South Africa. So there, there, is, there are major concerns in, in, to simplify the statistics Basically, half our adult population does not have employment and has no chance of ever finding employment. Uh, so they live uh, from one day to the other, praying and hoping that they can find food the next day. This is unsustainable in, in any country in the world. Uh, we are expecting, I believe on the 20th of this month, a, a national shutdown as announced by the EFF. And, and many are asking, is Ramaphosa going to, to cling on? Is he going to, to survive this shutdown and possibly renewed massive violence and destruction of property? So, yes, post Ramaphosa, um, the, the, uh, the speculations are there and, and people are hoping that the now appointed deputy president, Paul Mashatili, will be more energetic. He will not come in front of viewers and on TV looking tired, uh, depressed, and, and having, having trouble actually formulating his words. Uh, Ramaphosa's uh, performance uh, before with the announcement of the new ministers was probably his worst. So, interestingly, in that article, uh, Professor Thomas Hausen, your opening words uh, were uh, uh, that Ramaphosa, the dream candidate of the EU in 2017, has reached his sell-by date. So, he was the dream candidate. Why? Because he was believed to be a successful businessman. People didn't look exactly at the performance of this, his businesses. They didn't realize his... Uh, uh, what role he played in the in the downturn of London, where a share price of maybe ten pounds fell to ten ten pence. Uh, they didn't look at Chanduka. They didn't look at actual performance. They were hoping. They were hoping that a pragmatist, uh, in a way, a social democrat, uh, would tame the the transformation energy of the ANC. Would tame the the leanings towards a very radical economic transformation, which uh, according to the EFF should follow the model of Venezuela. And, and uh, South Africa, according to the EFF, uh, should have a president like Hugo Chavez. So um, that was the hope. That's why the West uh, appointed, uh, supported uh, very strongly the, the Ramaphosa candidature, even financially. A lot of money was raised in London to, to help him win the nomination at the 
ANC conference at the time. But, um, but he hasn't fulfilled the promises. Uh, the ESCOM situation, the power situation has got worse. Uh, the national railways during, during his term were destroyed. There are, are basically no more national railways. Uh, Petrosa is as bankrupt as ESCOM. And, and so we can carry on. The state-owned enterprises are ruined. Uh, of course, Minister Pravim Gordon should be probably the first one to answer for that. Um, but strangely, he was not replaced. He is retained together with the, with the pillars, the pillars of the old ANC, like, uh, like Minister Mantashe, like Minister Kelly, and, and quite a few others. Um, even Lamini Zuma is, is still around. At the age of 74, she is now Minister of Youth. This is, uh, like, in a way, like a bad joke. Um, and so the renewal of the leadership has not taken place. And uh, with that, the RAND will fall further. The confidence in, in South Africa's uh, future performance will, will not be good. So th th what you say is very interesting, uh, Professor Thomas Hausen, because um, if you consider that uh, the ANC was still, you know, very firmly um, in charge of uh, the government uh, in 2017, uh, they didn't look as though they would lose power at that point. They were still going to be uh, very much in control and leading government. Um, it would be ANC policy, one would imagine, that the European Union should have been concerned about as opposed to the actual candidate. So when you say that uh, there was an expectation that Cyril Ramaphosa would actually tame the transformation agenda within the ANC, what does that mean and how is that in the interest of South Africans as opposed to the interest of Europe? Well, European policy will, will look after its own interests, and there are trading interests. There are uh, very, very significant and large investments uh, from Europe in this country. Europe and the U.S. continue to be the main investors and the main employers in South Africa. So um, obviously, they will they will um, they will try and avoid or counter the trends in a party that would call for the nationalization of banks or nationalization of, of uh, industries uh, or, or implement what has been found to be unsustainable worldwide since the demise of the Soviet Union. Soviet Union didn't fall because uh, America was so strong and evil. It, it fell because its economic system had failed. And so the command economy, economic approaches to, they, they're out, they're completely dated. China will be the first one. To, to lecture South Africa that if you nationalize uh, your agricultural industries, you will face massive famines, as China experienced in the 1950s. So um, what is in the interest of South Africans, of course, that's for South African voters to, to choose and decide. Uh, I believe that um, it is not in the interest of South Africa to see a continuing decline of GDP. The GDP per per capita and year in at the time of transition in 94 stood uh, very close to Turkey's level at about $12,000 per capita and year. And we're now half, we're now $6,800 per capita and year. So uh, over 30 years, South Africa has become impoverished and poverty has become worse. And, and the desperation of, of people that aren't fortunate as, as we are here on our TV screens and cameras with Wi-Fi, and with uh, backup power, solar panels or generators, um, the, the, the great mass of the South African people actually deserve better. Indeed they do. Uh, but do you not think the continued interference of um, uh, countries in the West, uh, Europe, the United States, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of money was raised in London uh, to support uh, Cyril Ramaphosa's candidature. Uh, surely that was not for nothing. It, it was so that you are backing someone who would then uh, basically be at the forefront of promoting Europe's um, uh, position and, and their po foreign policy position uh, on what South Africa ought to be doing, as opposed to what may be best for South Africans. And, you know, do you not think that is problematic, Professor? Well, you, you, uh, you put it uh, 
you you put your finger on the on the wound. Um, yes, of course, our 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 friends in Europe have not always served this country well. Uh, let us go to the original sin of the ANC, which was the arms deal. Uh, Europe uh, basically bribed South African decision makers to agree to purchase uh, systems that were totally unsuitable to our environment and that are now unserviceable. Of the three frigates, only one can run. Of the three submarines, none uh, is serviceable. Uh, most of the helicopters are unserviceable. The fighter jets, I think only two are running out of 19 purchased. The, these were systems that we couldn't maintain, that we didn't have the money to service, and that had requirements, uh, skills requirements, that this country could not fulfill. So, uh, and we carried on with the energy transition, while, while, while about 60% of the global warming uh, goes on the account of, of the United States and Europe, and our contribution here in South Africa is a mere 2%. We, we were forced, we were pushed, we, our politicians were basically bribed with enormous promises and large amounts of money to, to switch out perfectly well-functioning uh, power stations and, and to throw this country into an energy emergency. Uh, this, this was actually not our making. So yes, the interests of Europe and the, the interests of the United States aren't always coinciding with uh, the need for, for South Africans to see progress and to develop and to have better opportunities. But then it is for politicians who take on the role of, of leaders uh, to, to weigh these things, to, to be steadfast, uh, to make choices and to be courageous. Uh, so also courageous against their own party. Uh, big leaders in, in the past like De Gaulle or Adenauer, uh, they would just tell the party to to shut up or, or fire me, mm. and, and they were leaders. So they built an enormously strong Europe together, uh, sometimes against the wishes of, of the parties. So we, we do have a leadership uh, failure, I would say, and it has to do also with age. Um, I'm, I'm 71 and I wouldn't take on a huge uh, responsibility anymore because simply Physically, at 71, you don't have the strength to do that anymore. Uh, we, we, we do not need geriatric politicians. We, we need uh, mm. the next generation to come in. And, and, yet, and this is why I'm very happy that, that we have Paul Mashatili now in line. Uh, and, and, and I would naturally be skeptical once again, you know, if um, uh, the European leaders, like they did with Cyril Ramaphosa in 2017, uh, come up and say, well, you know, we now endorse Paul Mashatile because then we have to ask how much money how are they raising for him in order to influence him, in order to take certain decisions in their best interest once more. But equally... The uh, president of the United States, Joe Biden, is 80 years old. So uh, apart from, you know, a few smatterings of young politicians leading powerful nations, it seems that we are firmly set in geriatric politics, as you put it, Professor. Well, I, I agree. Uh, I don't think we would have this horrendous war, uh, and this horrendous conflict between Russia and Ukraine, where probably about 400,000 soldiers are dead by now uh, if if uh, if we didn't have an american president who shows all the signs of of a of an uncompromising and and uh, vindictive old man who, who 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 also doesn't have to fear the future because he has no more future maybe he has another year or two or three or i hope for him 10 years to live but he knows he doesn't have to answer future generations. So whatever decisions he takes, it is actually dangerous. He, he could say, I'm going to be gone anyway, so I'm going to throw those nuclear bombs just to, be, just to be on the right, just to win. So we, don't, we should actually have laws and the constitutions uh, barring access to office to people over 70. And, and I am over 70. So, okay. but, but I, I think we, we have to realize that there is a time in life when, when, uh, when you can reflect, you can analyze, you can still work, but you shouldn't have a job that actually requires 14 to 16 hours a day of 100% concentration, hands-on, good judgment. Mm. And we see with the Ramaphosa team, the good judgment is missing. Um, right. We are probably the only country in the world that has these blackouts.
The, 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 these are not, power stations are not like flying to the moon. They're not complicated. And just a final one. We are out of time. So very briefly, Professor, will President Cyril Ramaphosa, in your view, um, make it to the end of this year as president of South Africa or at very least uh, to the next general election as president of this country, do you think? Uh, the entire opposition believes that he will, we will have to resign. He will be forced to resign before the end of this year and possibly in the next few months. Uh, the, uh, the legal issues uh, surrounding Falafala are getting more severe and more difficult. Um, it, it may be in his best interest uh, not to wait uh, for, a, for a vote of no confidence in Parliament if he loses the support of the, of the party. Uh, the first step to solve a problem is to admit that there's a problem instead of denying it. And at the moment, I think the, the current executive is still in a denial phase. They, they think, ah, it's not so bad. Um, we have lights in our offices. What are people talking about? Okay. But, but people are losing their jobs every day. Professor, we have to leave it there. Thank you so much uh, for that engagement, uh, German attorney and Professor International Emeritus of International Law at UNISA, uh, Professor Andre Thomashausen. Uh, he penned a piece on President Cyril Ramaphosa, whom he says has reached the end of his presidency. And he says uh, that uh, it's questioned whether Ramaphosa will actually step down during the course of this year, as you heard him more pointedly saying he would probably have to resign. So let us know your thoughts at Morning Live SABC.